Good afternoon, and welcome to the inaugural lecture in our Dorothy Day series. And I first want to thank the members of the committee who have worked to plan this event, and everyone here who is supporting this lecture series. And I know we're here because we're very eager to hear this lecturer, and, and we can hardly wait. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank the members of our 1804 Society, those are our students, um, who pay particular attention to making sure that the Notre Dame um, mission is clear at Emmanuel, and so 1804 is the year of the founding of the Sisters of Notre Dame, so here come two right now, so thanks to our students. I want to welcome back our alums, um, where today you have a chance to renew and hear again the values and the energy that was so integral to your educational experience here at Emmanuel. And I'd like to share just one or two things to let you know that that spirit continues today as we graduate in another week and a half, the class of 2014, and we are recruiting the class of 2019. Now 2019 comes in for the centenary, so that's where we are now. But so many of us, <laughs> so many of us, so many of you and, and of all of us, um, remember well our time here at Emmanuel. Some of you remember the lectures and the courses with Sister Maria Augusta Neal, where the class began with the question, remember the class that began with the question, how is it that two-thirds of the world goes to bed hungry when we have the technology and the ability to feed the world? That was one of the questions. Similar questions to that are still being raised here at the campus, and I'm just going to give you one example of it. We have a, a very large program in alternative spring break. Students go to Arizona, New Orleans. This year, we had a group of about 19 students spend time at our new Notre Dame campus in Roxbury, which is going to open fully in September. But those 19 students focused on food justice. And food justice is very much part of what we're going to move to. It's going to be, we'll have a group of about 32 um, students in a living learning um, reflective community beginning in September and the juniors and seniors are now being interviewed uh, to be part of this living learning community in Roxbury. But we will also be running an urban garden. So in preparation for that, um, really most of this year, and Bill could add to it, and several of our faculty have been working with the students to understand the distribution of food. We're talking now about in the city, so that we understand the ramifications. So I thought that was an interesting link from the very question that in the 1960s and 70s was posed by Sister Maria Augusta Neal. We're looking today at how our students are addressing that in different ways. <clears throat> and as you also know, this Notre Dame campus is includes the William Lloyd Garrison House. So that's another point of um, connection there. I loved reading Sister Simone's book. And I thought it's, I think it's so significant that today's the day that is the canonization of two popes, Pope John the 23rd and Pope John Paul the Second. And I think in so many ways that's linked to what we experienced in our lives at the time of the Vatican Council, Vatican II, and the influence that that had on our lives as lay people and on our lives as women religious. Because that in so many ways has been the work of the last several decades, really, of implementing and living out um, the message of the Vatic of Vatican II. And I would recommend this book. I've seen there's still some more copies. Uh, it is a great read. <laughs> and what I especially love, Simone, is how you were able to link the really the first big document of Pope Francis, the joy of the gospel, into this text. And especially since that just came out in November and this book came out in 2014, just right now, it was really quite a feat, I think, to, to do that. So I encourage you to read it, but most of all, it is a special joy to turn the program now to Rosemary, who is going to enter the introduction of Sister Simone. So thanks to all of you for being here. Sister Janet, Sister Simone, Dean Leonard, fellow alum alumni, future alumni, family and friends. Thank you for joining us today for the inaugural Dorothy Day Lecture. In 2010, members of the Class of 71 began to face the reality of the deaths of our classmates. We struggled with how to honor the girls of our youth 
who had led such remarkable lives. Our struggle to do the right thing caused us to reflect on the profound social and political changes that were occurring in the late 60s and early 70s. Civil rights, women's rights, and protests against the Vietnam War. And how those so social changes impacted on the women we became. Our college experience was broader than this campus and its classrooms. We left this campus believing that change is always possible and that silence in the face of injustice is not an option. The class of 1971 decided to develop and endow an annual alumni lecture. It was and is our hope that the Dorothy Day Lectures will be an opportunity to explore how transformations in the external world determine the course of personal and professional lives. The lecture series is named in honor of Dorothy Day, a courageous 20th century woman of faith whose life bore witness to the struggles for economic and social justice. After we had named the lecture, we learned that Dorothy Day had lectured at Emanuel 50 years ago in 1964, and today we honor her power of example. The choice of Dorothy Day was and is consistent with the Sisters of Notre Dame's long history of commitment to social justice. This lecture series has been generously endowed by the class of 1971 and is our way of saying thank you for the lessons we learned here and for the gifts of enduring friendships that have come from our years at Emmanuel. Critical to the development of the lecture series has been our collaboration with the Alumni Development Office. They have been tireless in their efforts and have provided us with wise counsel. We would like to particularly thank Joan Caldwell, Kenna Wood, and the dynamic duo of Edie Turner and Kay Moriarty O'Dwyer. We would not be here without them. Thank you is also go out to Marie Mancuso Cromwell and Shelley Torres Molnar for all their hard work in preparing for today's lecture. Thank you. We also thank the members of the Speaker Selection Committee for their efforts in reviewing and determining appropriate candidates for the lecture. They are Mary Kay Harrity, Ann Keegan, Mary McCauley Manzi, Maggie Martin, Susan Cooney Murphy, and Claire Pollard. Thank you also. Sister Simone was the unanimous first choice to be our inaugural speaker, and we are so delighted that you accepted our invitation. Sister Simone Campbell, she is a woman of faith, an attorney, a poet, an author, and a proud Californian. Sister has been a member of the Sisters of Social Service community since 1964. She served as the general director of her religious community from 1995 to 2000, and has been involved with the Leadership Conference of Women Religious as a vocal and articulate spokesperson. She obtained her law degree in 1977 at UCAL Davis and has been combining her commitment to social and economic justice with her legal skills for many years. She was the founder and lead attorney for the Community Law Center in Oakland, California from 1978 to 85. She was the executive director for Jericho, an interfaith interest group for advocating for the poor from 2002 to 2004. Since 2004, she has been the director of the network. It is a social, Catholic social justice lobby which educates, organizes, and lobbies for economic and social transformation. In 2012, Sister Simone came to wider public recognition <clears throat> when she was a featured speaker at the Democratic National Convention, when she reported on her Nuns on the Bus Tour. 
Sister Simone and a group of fellow Roman Catholic nuns toured parts of the country to rally support against Paul Ryan's budget, a budget plan that cut vital social programs for the poor and the struggling middle class. Sister Simone became a galvanizing force and a compelling religious voice in the midst of a turbulent presidential season. She followed up that bus tour with one this past summer, focusing on the need for immigration reform. She has appeared on many media programs and just about on every network. She lobbies on health care and immigration reform in Washington when she is not on the road as a speaker carrying her message. Her book, A Nun on the Bus, gives voice to the hunger, isolation, and fear that so many people in America are feeling right now and shows us that we can make and create real change in our communities and in our hearts. Her life reminds us that we are our sister's keeper. I give you Sister Simone. Take it away. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. You know, sometimes I don't recognize my biography. <laughs> One time I, I said to someone that I was getting a little bored with my biography, and I said, just make something up. Uh, and uh, she did. That was very surprising. I became, a, I became a bungee jumper and a variety of other things. But now uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, it is hard to believe what's happened in the last couple of years uh, in our life. But what you need to know is that, you know, this all started, all this notoriety started with the Affordable Care Act. And since I'm here in Massachusetts, I always like to say any problems with the Affordable Care Act are the problem because of Massachusetts. <laughs> You know that bill was never supposed to be the final law. It was supposed to be conferenced with the House bill, which was, in our opinion, even better. And then Massachusetts voted for Scott Brown. What were you thinking? <laughs> or not thinking, as the case may be. But it was because of that that we, um, the Affordable Care Act became the only bill they could get through because, as you'll recall, Mr. Brown ran on never voting for health care reform, even though it wasn't going to affect you all in Massachusetts. It was a great political soundbite. And so the Affordable Care Act was the way forward which was passed by the House. Now you might remember that there was this little thing about the Catholic Health Association coming out in favor of the Affordable Care Act. And then I wrote a letter in support of the Catholic Health Association and sent it out to all the Catholic sister leaders that were in my Outlook address book and told them to share it around. But while it was out being signed, uh, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops came out opposing it. Mm -hmm. Oh glory, because their staffs told them, the members of the staff told the bishops that it, the Affordable Care Act included federal funding of abortion. Now my astute political analysis of that statement is liar, liars, pants on fire. <laughs> and two federal courts have agreed with my interpretation. <laughs> Uh, they, didn't, they did it in a little more erudite and scholarly fashion. <laughs> but it is true, there is no federal funding of abortion in the Affordable Care Act. But the bishop's staff finally, a year and a half after the Affordable Care Act was signed into law, the bishop's staff finally changed their website to say, well, the bishops feared that there was federal funding of abortion. So I say what Jesus said. Fear not, fear not. And here is the challenge, here is the challenge. Fear can drive us into a separate, fighting, defensive posture. And what we want to talk about today is stepping into joy, which requires letting go of fear. 
it also requires making sure that I'm not insisting that the world get made in my image and likeness, but rather that we open ourselves up to the plurality of the wisdom of God who makes us all and all of creation. Now, I don't know, I've underst only met the class of 71 very briefly, but it seems like they've been a little group of troublemakers for a while. <laughs> and the, the fact that they chose Dorothy Day as the anchor point for this lecture series becomes a really troublesome anchor because Dorothy Day was trouble for any establishment. In World War II, she was a pacifist, even in the face of Hitler's extermination of the Jewish community. She stood up against bishops. She stood up against the government. She stood up against the economic reality of the time. That troublemaking, however, appeared to be fearless. Fearless, why? Because she was deeply grounded in the gospel. In the gospel that says, go, be with everyone. Pay attention to those who are most left out. And so, Pope Francis, it's a great day today with uh, the canonization of two popes. One I'm more in favor of than the other, but... <laughs> I didn't get a vote on that one, so. But, but it makes me think of Pope Francis and the amazing thing in one year that he has been able to do, not by changing structures, but by opening his heart to being candid about who he is and what spirituality is for him. And Pope Francis in the exhortation, I think, sets forth where we need to go. And here's his challenge. He says, this is the exhortation, you can see kind of my dog-eared version of the exhortation. But in paragraph 202, if anybody's taking notes, um, <laughs> the need to resolve the structural causes of poverty cannot be delayed not only for the pragmatic reason of its urgency for the good order of society, but because society needs to be cured of a sickness which is weakening and frustrating it, and which can only lead to new crises. Welfare projects which meet certain urgent needs should be considered merely temporary responses. As long as the problems of the poor are not radically resolved by rejecting the absolute autonomy of markets in financial speculation and by attacking the structural causes of inequality, no solution will be found for the world's problems or for that matter, to any problems. Inequality is the root of social ills. Whoa not something we hear very often. It's a great Dorothy Day style comment, but this is from the Pope. What a surprise. <laughs> but this is my favorite paragraph. Because I think this is what makes Pope Frank, as I like to call him. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't mind. I mean, that's affectionate. Pope Frank says in paragraph 208, after saying all these radical things, and uh, who was it? Rush Limbaugh was really upset about all the things that the Pope was saying. And uh, so the Pope says this. If anyone feels offended by my words, I would respond that I speak them with affection <laughs> and with the best of intentions. Quite apart from any personal interest or political ideology, my words are not those of a foe or an opponent. I'm interested only in helping those who are in thrall to an individualistic, indifferent, and self-centered mentality to be freed from those unworthy chains and to attain a way of living and thinking which is more humane, noble, and fruitful. 
and which will bring dignity to their presence on this earth. Whoa, he's only thinking of us. How wonderful. But here is the challenge. When we feel our resistance arising, it's in that very moment that the Pope says we're to be people of love and openness and welcome. He goes on to talk about peacemaking and what I realized was I thought of it as two separate uh, issues, the economic issues and peacemaking. But what I want to talk about this afternoon is his four points for peacemaking. I just want to talk, really talk about two of them. But he says that in order to make peace, he's got these four points, and this is what I think he's doing in the church and what we need to do in our nation. He is trying to make peace from in our polarized Oh, sinful, struggling church. And we need to do that as well in our national political conversation. He says the first key to making peace is, he describes it as time is bigger than space. Time is bigger than space. What he means is, that it's more important to be engaged in processes of conversation than in protecting my territory, my turf. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, what he says is that dialogue is the way forward with diversity, with a variety of perspectives. But how often, in my experience, we get protective of my idea, my approach, my way. The other day I was, where was I? I forget where I'm speaking when these things happen. Oh, I was up at uh, Mercyhurst College, up in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I had picketers against me. Can you believe? Isn't that amusing? So they were picketing. They were picketing me because they they had some idea that I was not pro life. Now what it turned out was because I tried talking to them, they didn't want to talk to me. But um, then. They, it turned out that I heard that they were upset because I wasn't for the criminalization of abortion. I don't think it's the right way forward. I, it hasn't worked for 30 years, so why do we keep doing it? So let's reach out to women. That's my approach. Let's reach out to pregnant women and support them, for heaven's sakes. What a radical thought. Um, in France, they have very permissive abortion laws, but you know what? They also have a tremendous amount of support for pregnant women, and they have a much lower abortion rate in France than we do here. It's just like, wake up. But unencumbered by data, they have their turf. <laughs> I know. Praise God for educational facilities like Emmanuel. <laughs> but, but what they're doing, what I realize they're doing, is they're holding on to this piece of opinion of territory and battling to protect it. And when you battle to protect your turf, you cannot create peace. You cannot create peace. So the Pope says the way forward is to engage in dialogue, to have a process, to talk. How lovely. How frustrating. It means, though, that we have to be willing to talk to people who think differently. Probably everybody in their family has someone like my brother Jim. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It always makes Thanksgiving or holidays so interesting. <laughs> but how do we, with love, talk to people who think differently? The Pope says if we want to create peace, we've got to practice speaking and listening. That's a challenge. The second point that he says is, it just fled my mind. Oh, yes. This one is very hopeful. He says, unity will prevail over conflict. <laughs> and then he goes on to talk about how people get tired of being mad at each other after a while. 
I, I have a friend who um, she and her sister were not speaking to each other for years. And finally one day we're talking and I don't know, family came up and she said, you know, I'm, I'm really tired of that. I want to know how she's doing. And it turned out neither one of them could really quite remember what, got, what created this problem. But they hadn't talked forever. But they were able finally to just say, oh well, and let it go. Now, I think what we are sometimes reluctant to do is to let it go. Because, at least for me, sometimes I like being right. Anybody have that trouble? <laughs> I'd much rather have you say, oh, you're sorry. Hmm. <laughs> but if we are people of the gospel, then we forgive 70 times 7. We keep doing it. We have to let it go. And we have to open ourselves up to a variety of perspectives. Now the third one is my very, very favorite. The third point is, reality is more important than ideas. Reality is more important than ideas. And while I'm not supposed to call names, um, this is sort of the Paul Ryan explanation of what's going on. He's, uh, Pope Francis says, reality simply are, whereas ideas are worked out. There has to be continuous dialogue between the two, lest the ideas become detached from reality. It is dangerous to dwell in the realm of words alone, of images and rhetoric. So the third principle comes into play. Realities are more important than ideas. Let me give you some examples. Um, I met with Paul Ryan after our first bus trip and I told him the story of Billy and his wife and I met Billy and his wife in uh, St. Benedict the Moor dining room in uh, Milwaukee I talked about them at the if you saw my convention speech you believe I spoke at the convention? It's kind of surprising. <laughs> anyway, but uh, Billy and his wife both work. Both are employed. They both make minimum wage. They have two boys. One's a 14-year-old. This 14-year-old kid who had obviously had a big growth spurt and was all angles and elbows and knees and hunger. <laughs> and um, Billy told me that he and his wife had to put their uh, salaries together to pay the rent. And they use food stamps during the day to feed the boys during the day. But that they went to St. Benedict the Moor dining room every night for a free dinner because the kids needed to eat. And Billy said, you know, parents, we could eat maybe once, twice a day, but growing kids, they need to eat more often than that. I was like, whoa. And here's his 14-year-old staring at the roll left on his dad's plate. You know, it was like, you could just feel the eyeballs, you know, covet, covet, covet. And Billy didn't even turn around. He, he must have felt his son's eyes on it, because he, he still talking to me, facing me. He says, all right, you can have it. And this kid just left on the <laughs> And I thought, oh my gosh, what a challenge. What a challenge to be so economically challenged and to have such a hungry kid, this bottomless pit. So I tell Paul Ryan the story, because these are the very people that Paul Ryan wanted to eliminate from the food stamp program, from the SNAP program. And you know what he said? He said, oh, well, Sister Simone, they're not the target of my policy. The Congressional Budget Office scored it really well. And he picks up this paper and hands me a paper that is supposed to explain why cutting Billy and his wife off food stamps is a good thing. And I realized, this was before the Pope had written this, but when I read this, I realized that was a perfect example. Billy and his wife need, these, need this safety net program to feed their family. 
Paul Ryan is in, in his head with a Congressional Budget Office scoring. Idea and reality were not meeting. See how that works? Let me tell you another one. I was at, a couple weeks ago, I was at the White House. Ooh, name dropper. <laughs> <laughs> We joke around. We joke around at the or some of the staff joke around at the office. All right, watch your toes. Simone's going to drop a name, so just watch your toes. <laughs> but uh, I was at the White House for the uh, signing of the executive order to raise minimum wage for the contract workers, the federal contract workers. And I'm sitting next to this lovely twenty-something young woman who was ecstatic to be in the White House. She had grown up in the area on the Virginia side of the, of the Potomac and had walked by the White House and never thought she'd get to be in the White House and were two rows from the, where the president's going to be and she is just like hardly sitting in her chair. She's so excited. And she was whoa. And I commented on this lovely blue dress she had on. She looked really stunning. And uh, her name is Robin. And Robin said, oh, I got this at my store. I, I at a national uh, clothing st uh, store chain and at, at a shop and I work full time and I, I make minimum wage but I got this with my employee discount and it was already on sale and so I only paid $20.43 for it. Isn't it great? And I said, oh yeah, it's beautiful. It's really nice. You look really nice. And she was all excited and all this. We got talking some more. And after a little bit she said to me, you know, by looking at me, You'd never know I have to live in a homeless shelter because I can't afford rent in this area. I work full time, but I don't make enough. Whoa. You work full time, and you don't have enough to pay rent in this area. What's wrong with the richest nation on earth that our people work hard and can't make a living? But that's reality. And then I go up on Capitol Hill to argue about raising minimum wage. Oh, oh it would be bad for business. It, it, would, it would lower, uh, it could lower, um, you know, productivity, or it could lower this, it could lower that, it could lower the other thing. Reality is, our people should be able to support themselves by work. And it's these very same people, like Paul Ryan, who want to say that people are lazy. No. They're paid too little. Ugh. But we're supposed to be loving towards all these people. It's annoying. <laughs> um, But then, after I met Robin, about a couple weeks later, I met, I was in uh, California, we had a fundraiser, or a woman put on a fundraiser for Network, which is lovely. My organization, or, I always say we're, we won't be out of work, but we might be out of money, but anyway. Um, but at this fundraiser, I sat next to Jason, who's this 35-year-old entrepreneur. And he was just about to sell his third business. He'd grown three businesses and uh, sold them off. And he told me that he pays all of his workers a living wage. From the least skilled, everybody makes a living wage. And in the San Diego area, that's a significant amount of money. And he said he would much rather have smaller profits because he's investing in his people. And when you invest in your people, then you have greater lawyer, loyalty, greater productivity, and it just a better business. And then he tells me, but you know, it's making him a bit upset that some of his competitors are paying such low wages that their employees are using safety net programs. And so Jason's taxes are, he said, I never thought of it this way, his taxes are going to support his competitors. Whoa. We're in this together. But the reality needs to be engaged of Jason's story and Robin's story and Billy and his wife's story. Because with just the economic theories, 
we get detached from the real story of the 100%. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. And the last point the Pope makes about peace building is that he says that um, he describes it as the whole is greater than the parts. We all knew that. But that every part has a different shape. And then he goes on to talk about we're not like a circle with everybody's a nice little wedge. We're a polyhedron and everybody's side is a little different shape. And we need everybody, everybody engaged creating this whole. Because I obviously have some specific opinions out of the reality that I know. But what the Pope says is that we need everyone's reality that can be different, diverse, various perspectives. And if there is one person missing from the whole, you don't have a whole. You have an H-O-L-E, not a W-H-O-L-E. Got the difference? And that he says to build peace, what we need to do is make sure everyone is included. Folks that want to fight with my perspectives, as well as those who want to affirm my perspectives. But that's the challenge. Building peace requires a discipline of acceptance. Not agreement, but acceptance. Now you look around the world and you think, oh my glory, there's just too much work to be done. I think I'm going to be an ostrich and hide out from it. And I, I have that feeling some days, you know, where it's like everybody's so hungry and you've got, I mean, what am I going to do for Robin? What am I going to do for Billy and his wife? What am I going to do for Jason? What am I going to do for Paul Ryan? What am I going to do for any of these people? And it just begins to feel too much. Do you ever feel that way? Yeah, all right. Good. Glad to see some heads shaking. It's just like, oh, brother. It is too much. But then I, I was praying about that after the bus, and I, I want to share a poem. Um, it's so weird to have a book and have my poetry. Anyway, my poetry's in the back. Some of my poetry's in the back. But, but I was feeling like the challenge of trying to respond to these huge, this huge amount of need. So remember the story of loaves and fish? Remember that story? Where Jesus says, or, or that people are following Jesus and the apostles are getting nervous. Oh, send them back to town. They're going to get grumpy. They're hungry. Um, you know, get them, get them gone before they get dis And Jesus says to them, feed them yourselves. Oh. So this is what uh, precipitated this. Well, the Matthew's Gospel has this very annoying line at the end of the story. And it says that 5,000 men were fed to say nothing of the women and children. <laughs> well, that annoys me no end. So I prayed on that for a while to try to think, now why in God's green earth would they say something like that? Well, here's my thought. Could be heretical, but here's my thought. Um, the reason the men were counted was that they were the only ones that thought it was a miracle. The women knew they brought snacks from home. <laughs> is going to take her family off to the wilderness and not bring some snacks, I asked. But the guys thought, oh, it's a miracle. Yes? Yes. All right. So that's the only piece you need to understand besides the story. But don't you love that? Yeah, I love it. Anyway, made it a lot better for me. But here's the poem. This is the challenge that we're facing. Loaves, it goes like this. It's loaves and fish. I always joked that the miracle of loaves and fish was sharing. The women always knew this. But in this moment of need and notoriety, I ache, tremble, almost weep at folks so hungry, malnourished, faced with spiritual famine of epic proportions. My heart aches with their need. 
apostle-like I whine. What are we among so many? The consistent 2,000-year-old ever-new response is this. Blessed and broken, you are enough. I savor the blessed, power at the broken, and pray to be enough. That's the challenge that we are facing in this 21st century. Because when you look at the reality of our world, It is the 100% that we need to care about, but also that we need to be active in the midst of it. Dorothy Day was a great woman of action, intimidating woman of action. I found it a bit frightening to hear, to read of her, it literally in the street confrontation. I'd much rather lobby on Capitol Hill than be in the streets, quite frankly. But then I realized, this is Pope Frank's insight, is that we need everyone, everyone's shape, everyone's call, everyone's action. But what I realized in this idea of loaves and fish is that if we all do one thing, it will all get done. There will be change for the future. And sometimes what happens is, um, I don't know, does this happen to you that sometimes when you get friends that get hot onto a new issue and they want to convince you to do it, to do their thing? Has that ever happened to you? I'm sure, and it, yeah, yeah. It's really annoying, isn't it? So uh, I'm sure I've probably done that myself. Um, <laughs> Yeah, join network, yeah. sign up, be, be an activist, uh, lobby your, your members of Congress, your senators. Uh, you've got some great senators, but you, they need to hear from you. Um, that's my thing. So I'll insist that you do it. Uh, but what I realized is, and this is where I think we have the challenge. In the richest nation on earth, we have the incredible luxury of often being secure economically, content, access to medical care, have enough economic wherewithal to get here, that in our security, we can forget we also need to be active. In our security, we can feel overwhelmed by everybody else's need as opposed to our own. In our security, we can forget that we are brothers and sisters to those who have not so much. And so the challenge becomes, what do we do? How do we respond? What difference can we make? And this is where I urge all of us satisfied folks, folks who have been blessed for reasons beyond my understanding. My life is so blessed, so cared for, so abundant, so rich, the challenge becomes how do I then respond to need? How do I let need come into my being? So in thinking about this, I, I think the key is, we can see in Dorothy Day, is that she let her heart be broken by a few people. And the question becomes, who breaks our heart? And what do we do about it? If our hearts are really broken, there's no stopping us responding. At least that's my experience. During our, during our conversation, I can find out if it's yours, but 
the my experience is because of Robin, because of Robin who works full time for minimum wage but lives in a homeless shelter, she broke my heart. This beautiful young woman who's so enthusiastic, she broke my heart. How can I not struggle for an increase in minimum wage from profitable companies? That's just ridiculous. It's outrageous. It's wrong in the richest nation on earth. Robin fuels my passion because she broke my heart. Billy and his wife broke my heart because they, they're having such a struggle raising these two fine boys. How could I not fight for them to get better wages, but then also to have the food they need till they can get better wages? What breaks your heart? What opens you up to seeing the bigger picture. And one of the great gifts of being in this amazing nation is that we can be in touch with other people. We can hear other stories. We can know what's going on. But with that comes a huge responsibility. We have been given eyes to see a complexity that is much bigger than just my family the backyard, the neighborhood. We've been given eyes to see a complexity that includes the Ukraine, oh my gosh, or Syria, or Korea, Indonesia, Africa in its various, oh the southern Sudan that's such a mess right now. We've been given eyes to see, but the question becomes, do we let our hearts be broken by that reality? And then, do we act? Do we take a step? Do we move beyond the comfort of just, oh, problem, 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 to doing one thing, just one thing? That's the challenge that we're facing. Because in the richest nation on earth, we, the people of the United States, have got to step up and take back responsibility. The whole, uh, my last part of my book, I probably shouldn't tell you the end, but anyway. <laughs> I, I'm I have to get used to talking about it, but what I realized was that we've been talking about civil rights in the last half of the 20th, 20th century. And civil rights are critically important, but there's something in our mentality where civil rights became about an individual, me and my rights. I got my rights, and if I have my rights, there may not be enough for you to have yours. I mean, that's currently what's going on without this voter ID stuff that's going on, but anyway, that's a whole other thing. But what I think is where we're called is in community, is that there's another side to that. And that is to civic obligation. That I have a right, but I also have an obligation. In a democracy, I have an obligation to use my voice. I have an obligation to speak up. I have an obligation to make sure that the table is big enough to include us all. That's the nature of democracy. And while I come at it from faith, I come at it because I believe with Pope Frank that we are all created in God's image and all need to be included in our conversation. But where we meet in our pluralistic nation is in our Constitution. And our Constitution says it's we, the people of the United States, are trying to form this more perfect union. So if there's civil rights that are mine, we have civil obligations that are ours. That we, the people of the United States, need to make sure everyone's included. I need to hear your voice. You need to hear mine. We need to speak out together. And we need to reclaim democracy away from uh, those that want to make it a sporting event. I know we're really close to Fenway Park and we were rejoicing that the Reds were out of town as we came today. But, <laughs> but what happens is when you make politics a sporting event, you make us spectators. And it becomes about the team. And whose colors did you pick and who did you root for? And then it's over and done with once the election's over. But democracy, the hard work of democracy means we have an obligation to be involved. 
We have an obligation to engage those who think differently. We have an obligation to form this more perfect union. I can tell you not a lot is happening in DC where I used to think that's where leadership came from. There is some leadership there. Some good stuff is happening. But there's also a whole lot more that needs to be done. Uh, two days ago, Speaker John Boehner uh, said in a small little town in his district in Ohio that he was just shocked at how cowardly the Republicans were for not bringing up immigration reform. Excuse me, you're Speaker, you can bring it up! <laughs> anyway, so I've been tweeting, anybody tweet? Follow me on Twitter, but anyway. Um, the, the, so I've been tweeting about it, you know. Wake up, stand up, do it. Um, but it's up to us to make sure that they do. It's up to us to use our voices. It's up to us to speak up. The challenge is that if we are going to change this economy to be inclusive, if we're going to change our world to build peace, if we're going to make the reign of God just a little more known in our time, we the people, need to let our hearts be broken and step up. That's the challenge. Because as Pope Frank says, we are in this together. We, the people of the United States, need to work together for the common good. Pope Frank is absolutely right, if I can find the place, Oh, turn it over. Pope Frank says, how I wish that all of us would hear God's cry. Where is your brother, as God asked Cain? Where is your brother or sister who is enslaved? Where is the brother and sister whom you are killing each day in clandestine warehouses, in rings of prostitution, in children used for begging and exploiting undocumented labor? Let us not look the other way. There is greater complicity than we think. The issues involve everyone. This infamous network is now well established in our cities and in our countries. And many people have blood on their hands as a result of their comfortable and silent complicity. Whoa. So, I believe that the challenge that we're facing in our nation at this moment is all about how do we, the people, let our hearts be broken open so that we are willing to leap to something new. To put down our fear and lift up the joy of the gospel because when we're in this together and we know somebody has our back, we can do anything. We could even create a whole lecture series as the class of 71 figured out. But the challenge is community. Breaking out of individualism to do this together because it is together that God is present. So to close this part before we open it up for conversation, which is always my favorite part of any talk, um, I wanted to close with this um, poem I wrote, uh, it's called Incarnation. But I wrote it in, um, <laughs> all right, I wrote it in Baghdad in uh, 2002. I went on a small peace delegation to Baghdad before we invaded in December of 2002. And it was our last night in Baghdad and uh, we had, our little group of 11 had gone out for dinner to an Italian restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and Arab hospitality is legendary. And on the uh, table, they had these little signs, because the restaurant we went to was in the embassy area. And so they had these signs in Arabic and English. Well, the English translation had a little problem, because they said, welcome, that was fine. And then it said, 
eat the music, listen to the spaghetti. <laughs> tried they tried really hard <laughs> the food was great but when we came back we walked back to the hotel and in the light from the plate glass window there was a wedding party out on the street and they had this old screechy little violin and an accordion making music and they were dancing well the 11 of us are sort of standing around on the edge on the periphery and um, a guy invites us in to come dance with the wedding party I was like, oh my glory, I'm a poet, I'm not a dancer. So I was doing my best, it was sort of like a folk dance thing. And this man who uh, was about this tall leans over and says to me, how long do my niece and her new husband have to live in peace? How long until you start bombing us? Whoa. This is the poem that was given that night. And this is about how we are connected and it's incarnation. It goes like this. Let gratitude be the beat of our heart, pounding Baghdad rhythms, circulating memories, the meaning of this journey. Let resolve flow in our veins, fueled by Basra's destitution, risking reflective action in a 15 second world. Let compassion be our hands, reaching to be with each other, all others, to touch, hold, heal this fractured world. Let wisdom be our feet, bringing us to the crying need, to friends or foe, to share this body's blood. And let love be our eyes, that we might see the beauty, see the dream, lurking in the shadows of despair and dread. And let community be our body warmth, radiating Arab energy to welcome in the foreign stranger, even the ones who wage this war. And let us remember on drear distant days, we are a promised Christmas joy. We live as one this fragile, gifted life, for we are the body of God. Thank you very much. Now my favorite part, conversation. This is the part where we make it real and, and it's I get out of my ideas. So. Uh, Great. Okay, we have a microphone we're going to pass around so that everybody can hear. What? We think it's on. Magic? Ah, Paul Ryan responses. Okay, what you need to know is that I'm trying to get another meeting with him. <laughs> I, I want to give him my book. And uh, uh, his scheduler said that he was not yet prepared to meet with me. <laughs> He's got to do his homework, I guess. I don't know. Um, he, the, the challenge with with him is that he lives in his head and I keep trying to get him to come meet my people. I want to break his heart. So what I was trying to do not only was telling him you know about Billy and his wife but he also does his, he has a sound bite. Oh yes, he's so cool. He, uh, I shouldn't make fun. Uh, bless me sisters and brothers for I did sin yet again. Um, he, he sleep, he doesn't have an apartment in DC he keeps his he, he tells me he keeps his family in Janesville like locked up in a kennel or something I guess <laughs> but he keeps his family in Janesville and he sleeps on a cot in his office 
Well now, what I said to him was, this has gotten him a lot of street cred in the Republican Party, but I said to him, is that good for you? Or is that good for your family? I I'm concerned that that might not be a, a really good thing for a long-term project. And he couldn't deal with my empathy. He had to change the topic. It was very interesting. Uh, and then finally, the best connection we had was after, after we finished a half hour meeting, <laughs> he told me, his, his staff people had told me that I was to come alone, at, it was sort of like the shootout at the OK Corral or something, you know. <laughs> I, I was to come alone, no press, you know, a mano a mano or something, I don't know. Anyway, um, but afterwards, he was walking over to the Capitol, and, and our office is on the Senate side, so I was going to walk that way, so we walked out together. And he said to me that he was, um, oh no, first I said to him, what are we going to say about our meeting, because I know I'll be asked. And he said, well, I think we can say that uh, we had a cordial conversation, and we agreed to disagree. But for me, that kept us separate. So I said, well, could we also say that we both care passionately about the future of our nation? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, that, so that's what I say, trying to build this bridge. But walking um, across to the, the Capitol from well, Longworth, the building his office is in, um, he said that he assessed whether, he was glad I didn't bring the press because he assessed whether or not people were really interested in the topic or just interested in the sound bite. And he had not been sure if I was interested in the topic or just the sound bite. So I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So I said, I'm passionately interested in this topic. Passionately. Then I got to testify in front of him and his committee last July. And he comes down to greet the witnesses. There are three Republican witnesses, and I'm the Democratic witness. It was really fun. It was great. Somebody else asked me about that, okay? Um, and um, he said, oh, Sister Simone, you let your hair grow. And I thought, ooh, he's been paying attention. So there's a connection. But getting him to that pastoral spot where I, I'm trying to touch his heart, and I want him to touch mine. So that's the challenge. One tough cookie, though. Ooh, ooh. Yes. Oh. I have a lot on the voice, but um, you you mentioned um, you know federal um, immigration reform. I mean, I used. Do you think it's mostly going to come from the states? I mean, I noticed oh, there's a lot, and in, in, um, like in a lot of the New England states, you know, they you know provided um, you know driving licenses and you know um, right. in-state tuition and those kind of things. But they just seem such small steps. Do right. you see any movement to, to create a lot of push? We have about 58 days to make it happen. 58 days, phone early, phone often. Um, we did a, um, were any of you involved in our Lenten project? We had about 1,300 folks around the country. Uh, we had a calendar, <laughs> all the Catholic groups in D.C. were part of this, where we had a calendar for Lent, and every weekday you prayed for a different member of Congress, and after you prayed, you called them. <laughs> and we had pictures, and their, where they were from, and their phone number right under their picture. It was fabulous. We kept getting uh, emails and phone calls from, call them off, call them off. <laughs> Bring up immigration, you'll be fine. Uh, but what we've got to do is make it so hot for them that they've just got to do it. So we have a very narrow window. The problem is states can do some humanitarian stuff, but you can't, it's a federal issue to change status. The other piece is, is some people are lamenting deportations. The number of deportations. The way to stop the number of deportations is change the blessed law. It is not President Obama's fault that there's so many deportations. Not that I have any feelings on the topic. Um, <laughs> but the, the fact is that the, um, President Obama was in the Senate in 2007, the last time we tried to do this, and what resistors to immigration reform said was President Bush wasn't enforcing the law anyway, so why should we pass a new law? President Obama learned that lesson. He cannot stop the deportation because the way to stop the deportation is fix the law. It's macro politics. So all of our pressure has got to be fix 
the law now. So the way you can do it, most of the Massachusetts delegation is pretty good. Rhode Island is pretty good. Connecticut is pretty good. What you can do is you can call others who need help, a little encouragement, but you can also call your friends who have flown south and registered in places like South Carolina and Florida and all those garden spots and get them to call their representatives. So there's a variety of ways that we the people can make a difference, but we've got a very narrow window to make this happen. So, we the people of the United States, stand up, said she authoritatively. And if you wonder what we're talking about, look on our website, networklobby.org, immigration. Got it all laid out there. There's an agreement, we can get the, we have the votes. This is what's just driving me nuts. We have the votes. John Boehner's just a wimp to bring it up. <laughs> Said she without calling him a name in an ever loving, thoughtful. Yes. Um, um, John Boehner is a Catholic. Paul Ryan is a Catholic. I know, isn't it a mystery? Well, <laughs> how likely do you think it is that groups such as yours? put pressure on the bishops in the United States to point at them rather than someone who is perceived as overly uh, supportive access to choose. Catholic legislators. Here's the challenge. We're part of the Justice for Immigrants Coalition on Immigration Reform that's run by the bishops. It is the most frustrating coalition I've ever been a part of. I told you about our, our uh, prayer thing for Lent. We, we were the lead for Justice for Immigrants Coalition and everybody in the coalition agreed to promote this same piece of work, okay? They had a meeting three weeks into Lent and the Justice for Immigrants website had yet to put it up. Now the guy who heads it, Kevin Appleby, fine guy, just not without, just doesn't have a field sense. He doesn't know how to get people rallied. And um, said to his underlings, what, it's not up? It got up 10 days before Easter. The bishops have, um, are fairly ineffectual. Now, to his credit, Cardinal O'Malley has in fact been putting pressure on Boehner and did a mass down on the border that was very moving, fabulous. But do you know, the bishop's office had no media strategy for having that be heard in the districts where it needed to be heard. It was heard here, but not in other places where we needed missionary work. So we've got some trouble with capacity at the bishop's staff. We also have trouble, apparently, what they objected to is that because network had done all this work on the uh, calendar, that we had network on the calendar. That made the bishops nervous. So they had to cut that out. Uh, what was the other thing? There was one more thing. Oh, I know what it was. We picked on the ones who had not supported immigration reform. We picked on, we put them on the calendar. <laughs> there were four Democrats and the rest are Republicans. Duh. <laughs> That's because they hadn't supported immigration reform. Well, the bishops just didn't know because we didn't have an equal number of... Uh, <laughs> so it, it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. Now, if you want to follow a group that's really good on immigration reform is the Interfaith Immigration Coalition, IIC. It's fabulous, they do very creative work. We work with the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim community in DC. They, they are, they're the ones that are really making a difference from the faith community on this issue. It's really disappointing. This is the thing that the bishops should be the lead on. Because Pope Frank has all this stuff about immigration that's fabulous, fabulous. But it's staff, and, and the real reason is staff. The real reason is staff. They've been poorly staffed, which is, just makes me want to weep. 
Thanks for asking. Yes. Oh, okay. Like a stairmaster. <laughs> Okay, and then to the back. Okay. I think this might be beyond your job description. But hearing you speak about morality, well, we have sisters in the Philippines. That's how we respond to it. Uh, Here's the deal. That <laughs> do you know what the best <laughs> the best birth control in the world is? Electricity. <laughs> Development. The horrible truth for most Filipino families is that you need a lot of young workers to make a family viable and that infant mortality is so high is that it's a serious worry how many children will live to adulthood. This is a horrible, horrible reality. It's beginning to change in some places. Our sisters work in the Philippines uh, with uh, relocated squatters from Metro Manila. But their destitution, their desperation. Our sisters have done economic microenterprise economic development with them. I mean, they're doing a fabulous cooperative, but it's one family at a time. It's so slow, so slow. But it's very easy for us in the U.S. to see the frightening reality of hunger and all this with a, with an analysis of population and just thinking, excuse me. There's some things you could do. But the fact is, in that culture, in that setting, there are other prevailing forces that are creating need for large families. Like the old days when we were on farms in the US. And so it's unsustainable long term, but the re really the way forward, I think, is realistic development and education. Uh, those are the two biggest factors for making a difference in population. Uh, development, get electricity in, and there's options. And um, <laughs> I know, it always makes me laugh. Nuns talk about, you know, contraceptions and all this other stuff. What do I know about it? Not much. <laughs> I know what I read, but, um, but, but it really does make a difference. So development's key. And that's why international development, Catholic Relief Service, those kinds of things are really an important program to be a part of. And the second is education. Education of women is a huge, huge, important global agenda. And Pope Frank talks about it too in the Grand Exhortation. The role of women is, is huge in this. And if women are educated, women know options, women can make choices, women take care of families. Blessed and broken. We know how to go, how to do it. But it's, that's way better than what happens often is that we can get kind of righteous in our proclaiming what they ought to do. But the best way is to create uh, local solutions, I think. Others. Oh, good. Oh, wait, there, I told the woman in the black back there, I forgot. I got so involved in the last one. I'm Marie Gleason Totter, and I'm the lucky winner of your book. <laughs> and the best thing is, I'm, a, I'm from the class of '71. So <gasps> <that's a laughs> All right, even better. Uh, um, I'm on, on, only in the early chapters, but I'm already very inspired. So I'm oh, telling everybody get a copy of this book. But um, one thing that really inspired me, and I wonder if you could talk about it, was what you wake up saying each morning and go to bed saying each night. The um, uh, come, what, Holy oh, come Holy Spirit, uh, and and many times in between. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my community is dedicated to the Holy Spirit. I'm a sister of social service, and somebody know where, where are you? Who knows? One of our sisters. It was so exciting. Um, but we're dedicated to the Holy Spirit, and so my emblem. This is my pen. It says, "Come Holy Spirit." Sometimes, if I'm giving a talk and I don't, it's usually answering questions where I don't quite know where I'm going. I'll just kind of rub my. <laughs> the physical prayer. Hmm. <laughs> But it is the Holy Spirit that's at the core and the heart of all of this. 
Because really, okay, we, what most people haven't put together is that the nuns on the bus, you know, the big explosion of notoriety was all because we got named in the Vatican censure network. My little organization got named as a bad influence in the Vatican censure. And that four days before the Vatican censure came out, <laughs> we had had our 40th anniversary party at network. And we had a big party at Trinity, those Trinity, your sister university. And it was fabulous, but the big question was, how do we get the word out that we've been working on Capitol Hill for 40 years. <laughs> so we had all these little ideas of, you know, a Google ad or ask a member to get a member, or do little things like that. But four days later, the Vatican answered our prayer. <laughs> so, but my prayer then became with the notoriety, what I knew right away was that I could speak to the press because network was not created by the Vatican. But my sisters at the Leadership Conference of Women Religious could not because they are created by the Vatican. And hold them in prayer this week because the leadership is in Rome this week. And they're very nervous about what's going to happen because they're very frightened that, that we're going to get caught again in the political crunch of uh, reaction to the popes trying to make change in Rome. And so, you know, trickle down abusive kinds of behavior. Uh, anyway, they're worried, so pray for them this week. But my prayer then became, come Holy Spirit, how do we use this moment for mission? How do we use this moment for mission? And so my prayer, I do sort of a Christian Zen meditation, but what it was inside myself, you sit without moving for 25 minutes and, and it's like, help, 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 help. This little distress signal, you know. And um, what came to me was the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, not the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan woman at the well, at, where Jesus, a man, talked to a woman. A Jew talked to a Samaritan. The Jew was in foreign territory. He was in Samaria. He not only talked to her, but he asked her for help. And what that did for me was to say, I should ask foreigners, the secular world, for help. And that's what happened, is that we had a meeting because uh, I, I asked um, all of our colleague organizations in DC to come together on May 14th at our office. And um, that as a, but the sign of the Holy Spirit for me is in the city where everyone wants to claim credit for something that works. I mean, everybody's ready to claim credit. Nobody remembers who first said road trip at that meeting. Nobody knows who came up with the idea for going on the bus. It was a Pentecost moment. It was a group. I mean, it was totally Pentecost. Because by the end of the meeting, an hour and a half meeting, I had a map in my head. We were going to pull it, because I knew where the mother houses were, where we could get free lodging. And, <laughs> and we were going to push back against the Ryan budget, and we were going to lift up the work of Catholic sisters. And because what a lot of people don't know is Catholic sisters often take federal money and leverage it and do really good things with it. So um, anyway, prayer. So that, and we were going out in a wrapped bus. I didn't know what a wrapped bus was. <laughs> If it had been left to us, what we would have done, because we had too small of an imagination just as an organization, our little idea would have been, I'm sure, we would have cut out felt letters, glued them on cardboard, <laughs> tied them to a Prius, and driven around like it was. <laughs> but, but when you ask, but, but the, it was really as a response to my prayer that this idea came and then the rest came. And we had this meeting on May 14th, we were on the road June 17th. I mean, it's like a miracle. I said we couldn't go public until, you wanna hear all these miracles? Yes. Uh, it's, just, it's just so amazing. Because, okay, I said we couldn't go public until we raised, what did we need that time? I don't know, we needed like $120,000. Money had been horrible for us. We'd had to lay staff off, the economy was terrible. Ugh, ugh, ugh. I had the money pledged in 10 days. It was a miracle. Not only that, but the next day, May 15th, the bishops, promoted again yet by the bishops, they don't know, they're our best PR, really. <laughs> and um, they hosted, hosted, that means they paid for, an afternoon and evening, I think it was at 
the, it was either the Four Seasons or the Ritz Carlton, I can't remember, a dinner, at an afternoon meeting and dinner, why they were being persecuted by the Obama administration. <laughs> and persecuted at the Ritz Carlton or the Four Seasons, I don't know. Anyway, but here's the gift. One of the women that had been at our meeting on May 14th is sitting next to Lori Goodstein of the New York Times, the religion reporter. And she, Sally sort of whispers to Lori, oh, the nuns are thinking about doing something, this, this, and Lori gets all excited. So Sally calls me, she says, call her, call her. So I call her on the day, May 16th, and uh, before Lori leaves DC. And Lori's so excited about this idea, but we can't go public because I don't have the money and I don't know if it's going to work and blah, 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 blah. And Lori says to me, well, would you give me an exclusive? Give the New York Times an exclusive. <laughs> Holy Spirit! <laughs> so I said yes. Um, then what, what else happened? Okay, so we got the money, New York Times, so then the New York Times breaks it uh, on June 6th, because by the, anyway. And so then I get a call from this guy, uh, the guy who's the reservation age, uh, reservations at the Fort Des Moines Hotel. And we were going to start in Ames. And he calls, he, his owner had read it in the New York Times. He called him up, said, offer the nuns a free night at the hotel. Well, I didn't know we had to go to Des Moines to get to Ames. So the guy offers this hotel, isn't that sweet? Thank you very much. Well, let me see how this shapes up. But then once I figured out, Ames doesn't have an airport, and you had to fly to Des Moines, then we took him up on his offer, you know? Um, and then the Sisters of Humility and Mary here that were coming to town, we were just gonna get on the bus there. And they said, you can't just come to town. We've got to bless you. <laughs> and so they organized this whole amazing, amazing blessing. They had like 350 people that people had driven up from Omaha and from Sioux Falls. I mean, it was just amazing. This is, we had Christian, uh, we had all of the Christian denominations. We had the Buddhist temple represented, a whole, all the Buddhist folks. Who knew there was a Buddhist temple in Des Moines? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was just amazing. But the Holy Spirit was alive and well. And then when we got to Ames, our very first stop, Oh yeah, th this is the other piece. I love telling bus stories. They're, they're all in the book, so you can skip that chapter. But, um, <laughs> but uh, um, we get to, uh, we're going up there to see Steve King's staff, and we have an appointment. And we get up there, and they have posted on their glass door in the strip mall, out with constituents. <laughs> and that's locked. Well, we had all this press riding with us. Halfway to Ames, we had to stop so we could rotate press off the bus and get a new set of press on. So we have all this national press with us. And this photo becomes me trying to slip the faithful budget under the door of Steve King's office. And that went viral. None stood up. <laughs> But it was the Holy Spirit again. <laughs> the Spirit is alive and well. And as I got to tell Rachel Maddow, is making mischief. It is glorious. That's why while the Vatican censure is painful, worrisome, just anguish inducing on some levels, the Spirit is also using it for mission. And we've got to trust that all works to the good. I mean, that's the contemplative life. All works to the good. It's amazing. Thanks for asking. I got to tell all my stories. That's cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Glad you're liking the book, too. It makes me nervous, but. Mm -hmm. Yes? Oh, what the joy of the gospel. Exhortation. The joy of the gospel. It's the exhortation that he issued in November. And the, it's uh, the. He's got all, it's just, it's just so fabulous. Do you know he has a whole chapter in here for people giving homilies? Oh, it's posted on the, uh, on, uh, the, the website for the college. Yes, yes. So it's, it's Joy of the Gospel. It, we're using it for our theme uh, for the whole year. It's, it's, just, it's just exquisite. A joy ever new, a joy which is shared. And, and his whole idea is the gospel that you can only know joy if you're connected to others. Isn't that fantastic? You can't go off by yourself to fluff up your joy, you know. <laughs>
You also can't do it for hope. I've discovered hope is a communal virtue. All right, anybody else? Victims? Oh, yes. Oh, when I testified in front of, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very sweet, thank you for asking. I had even forgotten I asked you to ask. It looked like a new question. Uh, when I got to testify, um, the way it works, it was the first time I'd testified in front of a committee. We do briefings on the Hill, but that's where we're in charge. But when you testify, you have the bank of you know members of Congress and they ask you these questions. And Republicans have their witnesses, but because the Democrats are the minority, they only get one witness and the Republicans get three. But here's the Holy Spirit again. Many Republicans are Catholic. And one of the Republicans uh, said to me that he'd always gone to Catholic school and the nuns had always asked him questions. So he wanted to ask the nun a question. <laughs> but what happened is there were a lot like that. And so I got way more air time than would have happened ordinarily because they wanted the joy of asking a question. What fun. That's easy for me. I, see, this is where my lawyer heart gets going. So. Um, the, the one uh, uh, member of Congress said, well, sister, he liked saying sister about 75 times just to enjoy it, but uh, wouldn't you, oh, the reason we have poverty is that we've got so many single parent families, you know, just headed by moms. So don't you think that we ought to support marriage as a way of, uh, you know, alleviating poverty? Okay, so you would think. Here's my answer. I loved it. It was so much fun. <laughs> well, I practiced family law for 18 years. That's principally what I did in my work in Oakland, California. And I know that the single greatest cause of the breakup of relationships is economics. And the most important, I believe you should support marriages. The most important thing you could do to support marriage is to raise the minimum wage. <laughs> But again, that's the Holy Spirit, so, uh, or an impish spirit. I'm not sure holy goes with that. But, but it, it is, um, it was so much fun. And you know what his response was? His response was, or we could do away with minimum wage altogether. But his time was up, and so I couldn't say, what? <laughs> and I've been trying to get a meeting with him since then, but I haven't been successful. So I want to know, what were you thinking? But anyway, but that's their approach. Free market, trickle down, doesn't work. All right, we've been here long. Can we just end with a poem? Um, the and I want to end with this because this is all grounded in our faith, in, in a contemplative life, in a spiritual life. And I, I do try to talk about it in the book, but it, this, is, this is the um, the challenge to reach the new economy or to reach anything that is new. And it's called Living Waters. Think of baptismal water, all those images, metaphor, everybody's back in college, we can think those deep, profound thoughts, okay? <laughs> anyway, Living Waters. Impetuous me favors the passionate tumult of spring river flooding. Sensuous me favors the indolent caress of summer river flowing. Reflective me favors the penetrating seep of autumn river trickling. Even aloof shy me favors the chilled reserve of winter river freezing, but all of me resists evaporation. I resist the sucking, pulling, warm air resting me from known boundaries. I resist drifting unseen to unknown parts. I resist the uncertainty of unformed floating 
yearning rather to surround rocks and carve new paths. I resist the ambiguous foggy drift, but luckily, at times, I am yanked into air, there, beholding Earth's anguish, weep, weeping, raining, puddling, perhaps the beginning of an exuberant spring. Thank you very much. Sister Simone, you have been a blessing. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. We hope that you have enjoyed the lecture today and will join us next year on April 26, 2015. For these lectures to continue, we will need your support. We'll need the support of your presence, so keep on coming. Send us your ideas for future speakers, and my email is in the uh, program. Financially, we will need your support, and it is listed how you can support us in the back of the program. And we would also recommend, if you wish to support the network, you go to your website, which is networklobby.org, and support the wonderful work Sister Simone is doing. Sister Simone will be signing books, <laughs> if you, or if you wish to purchase them. And for those of you who would like some refreshments, they are in the auditorium over in the administration building. But thank you for such a glorious start to our lecture series. Thank you.